2 Timothy chapter 3, as we launch out today, the, the pillars of Christianity. The pillars of Christianity we're going to be looking at. Ev what every Christian should know about the pillars of Christianity, and we're going to look at the first one this morning that is uh, probably the most important, important one because all the rest rest on this one and are built upon this one. And some of this is going to be like a, a, a class time, a college course uh, in, in, in Bible. So you're all going to Bible college now. And when we're done with this, you'll get a certificate diploma that you have graduated from Bible college. Amen. This morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. What every Christian should know about the Bible. What every Christian should know about the Bible. Most of you, and I trust all of you, have one in your hand or in your lap this morning. But how much do you really know about it? Well, we're going to look at that this morning as we start, because all the other pillars of our faith are built on the foundation of this pillar. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. All Scripture, how much? That means Old Testament and New Testament. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is the word that means God breathed or breath came literally from the very breath of God. How much scripture did? All scripture. And it came from the breath of God, not the breath of man. It came from the breath of God, not the breath of a denomination. It came from the breath of God, not the, 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 the breath of uh, uh, some organization. But it came from the very breath of God. And notice the four wonderful things about it. It is profitable. That means beneficial. It is profitable for doctrine. That's teaching. That's what we're going to do here in just a minute. All right, for reproof. Well, we don't like that, but a lot of times we need to be reproved. Amen. Then God corrects us for correction. And then God just doesn't leave us standing there. He instructs us. For instructs us into righteousness. So as we begin our new series here on the basis of beliefs of Christianity, we're going to start, we're talking about the beliefs, the basic beliefs of Christianity, okay? We're going to start with the most foundational doctrine of all, and that is the inspiration of the Bible. The Bible is the foundation of Christianity and the church. The church is built on the Bible, the foundation of the Bible. 1 Timothy 3.15 all right, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtst to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. The church is the pillar and the ground of truth. So that's why we're looking at the pillar of the Bible, because it is the pillar of truth, and everything else is built on truth. Amen. So the first pillar this morning that we're going to be looking at, which is the load-bearing pillar, and every other truth rests on this pillar. And that is the Bible, the Word of God. What do you know about it? Well, we're going to learn some things this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, how we thank you for this morning. We praise you. We give you glory and praise. Pray for those folks again down south. We pray for Carol's brother, Don. Father, that you'd raise him up out of ICU, Father, getting back up on his feet. Father, restore his health to him and uh, giving back to us for a little while longer, Lord. We would appreciate it so much. And be especially, again, with those down south, Father. Just bless them. Uh, uh, may your grace be sufficient, your mercy uh, fresh and new every morning. And, Lord, may you work things out for them in the days ahead. May Christians from all over the country uh, rise up to help uh, our state and our folks down there. And we would certainly appreciate it. Now, Father, as we open the Word of God here this morning, uh, we know that it's God-breathed. Whatever passage of Scripture we're reading this morning, God breathed it. It came from the very breath of God. It is the pillar of our faith. It is the pillar of our foundation of Christianity from the very beginning. And so, Lord, help us today as we learn from it. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher, our guide, as He guides us into all truth. He will speak the truth because He hears from the one who is the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Now we ask once again you'd help your servant. 
Father, that you would anoint his lips, his heart, his mind. We ask that you would bring to remembrance the things Jesus has said to us this week in our study. Father, we ask for that anointing and power from on high that you would give us during this hour. And we ask it in faith believing, and we receive it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And praise the Lord. So why can you and I this morning trust the Bible? Why can we trust the Bible? I'm sure you've had people talk to you about that. You may have had people say something to you. How can you trust that book? You know, who wrote that book? And, and you know, that's man's book and man write. And, and you've, you've been there. If you've witnessed and talked enough with people and gotten conversations, these are kind of some of the conversations go on and, and everything. And say, well, in the world, how in the world can you put your faith and trust in this book called the Bible? Well, let's learn, okay? How many of you do believe it and trust it today? With all your heart, with all your life. Well, why? You got to have some answers, man. We need to give some answers. The, the apostle tells us to be ready at all times to give an answer of the hope that's within us. And so where do we get our answer of our hope? From the Bible. And when people ask you these things and talk to you about it, they say, well, how do you know that's the Word of God? And why do you trust it? Why do you believe it? And who wrote it? And all these things. You need to have some answers. You need to have some good, solid answers. So that's why I think you're going to enjoy this today. I hope you will. I will. I think you're going to learn some wonderful things. How can I know that the Bible is the Word of God? I'm going to give you three reasons. I'm sure there are more, but I'm going to give you three good ones anyway, all right? Three good reasons why the Bible is the Word of God. First of all, because of what we read, the Bible is inspired. The Bible is inspired. You just read it, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, in other words, it literally came from the very breath of God's lips, God's mouth, His breath, as He breathed the, the Word out. So that's how we can do it. 2 Timothy 3.16 again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Now the word profitable there means it's beneficial. What we're doing this morning is beneficial for you. So you know something about the book you got in your lap. Yeah, man. All right, so let me give you something. You don't have it there, but I'll get some with you. Inspiration is the process by which God communicates His message without error. Without error. Using the personalities of men to compose and record God's message without error era. That's what inspiration is, okay? So I hope you, hope you're going to remember that, all right? 2 Peter 1.21 says this, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men. Okay, in other words, the prophecy of old time, that would be the Old Testament, it, it did not come by the will of man. But holy men of God most spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, these were special men that God raised up and moved upon them with the Holy Ghost of God and breathed His Word into them to write it down for us. God is the author of this book. Man was the scribe that wrote what God told him to write. So you need to understand that. This is not man's Bible. This is not the Baptist Bible, even though it's the Bible we believe and teach and preach out of. All right? But this is not man. It's not a denominational Bible. Okay? It's God's Bible. It's God's Word. And you're going to learn some great things. So the first thing, the reason why I can trust this book, church, is because it's God-inspired. That's why I can trust the Bible this morning. It's God-inspired. I want you to know something else about it. It is unified. The Bible is unified. In John 5, 39, Jesus said this, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. See, all the Word of God testifies of Christ because it's one uni unified book. From Genesis to Revelation, you'll find Christ almost on every page if you look for Him. You'll find the bloodline from Genesis to Revelation all through the Word of God because it's a unified book. And we thank God for it. And, uh, and so we find that uh, a unified group effort some 40 authors over 1,500 years with different styles, personalities, lo geographical locations, languages, and yet all coming together with one unified theme, and the theme is Jesus Christ. 
Now you tell me any other book that can claim that. There isn't. That's why it's a unified book. Now we say 40 authors, they were men that wrote. God is the author of his book. The 40 men. Over 1,500 years. Without one era, without one contradiction. Oh, we'll cover that too, so just hang in here with me. Because I've had all, how many times people said to me, oh, there's so many contradictions in it, how can you believe that? So you know what I do, folks? I take my Bible here, show me one. Well, no, there are, there there just are. I said, well, what do you mean they just are? If there are, and you say there are so many, you ought to at least know one, so just show me one. Well, 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 now see, they can't. You know why? Because there is none. I don't care what all these other so-called scholars claim to be and all that kind of stuff. They're in error, not God. See, God's word is no error in God's word. You see, they're the ones that have the error, not God. But oh, you see, this, you know, I'm, we got this wonderful unified book. And we start in Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. The whole theme of the Bible is the person. That's what we just read a while ago. Search the scriptures because they testify of me. So it's a unified book. We praise God for that. Thirdly, the Bible is inerrant. It is inerrant. That means it's without error. What we have in holding our hand today is the inspired word of God. It is the plenary. That means full. The word plenary means full. It is the plenary, verbal, inspired word of God. It's inerrant. It's without error. That's why I can trust it this morning. That's why you can trust it this morning. Oh, praise God for it. Hebrews 3, 7 says this. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith. Who says? The Holy Ghost says. Today, if you will hear His voice, then you can go on. That scripture says, harden not your hearts. We find that also in, in Hebrews 3, verse 15. Hebrews 4, 7. We find that same saying. Today, if you hear His voice. See, this word is God-inspired. It's God's breathe. So it is God's voice. So today, if you hear His voice. Are you with me? Come on, church. Talk to me. And that's what we've got to be today. All right? And that's a quote, actually, from Psalms chapter 95 and verse 7. Gave you the verses there. You can look them up later. That quote came from the Old Testament in Psalms 95, 7. And when he said again, today, if you hear his voice. Now, remember, those, that was written to the Jewish nation, of the nation of Israel. Hebrews was written to Jews at that particular time, and he's talking about in the day of provocation, and the day of provocation was at Kadesh Barnea in the wilderness, if you remember, and they, weren't, they didn't disobey God, and, God opened, and, and guess what was the punishment? They weren't going to go into the promised land. Everybody 20 years of age and over died in the wilderness at Kadesh Barnea. Because why? They did not hear today his voice. So let's take a look a little bit here. I want to give you five good things here about the inerrancy of Scripture. The inerrancy of Scripture this morning. The Scripture itself testifies of itself. The best commentary, church, on the Word of God is the Word of God. If you'll just keep reading, it'll usually give you the, the, uh, the interpretation of it. Sometimes in the same verse. Don't stop reading. Keep reading. And you'll see what it says, and you'll know who it's talking about, and so forth. So the Scripture itself testifies of itself. Remember, it's without error. The Holy Ghost saith, God saith, the Lord saith. And the Lord said 219 times in the Word of God, and the Lord said. Today, if you hear His voice. 46 times the Bible, the God said. God said. And in the New Testament, Jesus said 65 times. So add that up and what do you've got? you got over 300 and some times in the Bible it says, The Lord God Jesus said. Today, church, if you hear His voice. Now, how many can think God can make an error? How many think God could tell you something that's not, shouldn't be now? What, amen? So you see, that's why it's without error, because God said it. See, a holy and righteous and perfect God is not going to tell you a lie or tell you something that isn't true or something that's contradiction or anything else. He's going to tell you the truth because He is the truth. Therefore, you see, you can trust the Word of God that it's without error because, by the way, just because we read those phrases 300 sometimes that God said, the Lord said, Jesus said, may I say that all Scripture is given by inspiration, so God said it all. You have something that's wonderful in your hands. 
You have something that's wonderful at home on your shelf. You have something that's wonderful sitting on the dash of your car turning yellow from the sun. Hello. You have something that's wonderful on your coffee table when you go home today and will be there until next Sunday. Now you're saying, preacher, you're going to meddling. I'm not meddling. I'm just telling you the truth. Why in the world would you want to put it on your dash, leave it on your card table, put it on the shelf when it's the most precious and wonderful thing you can have in your life? Why in the world would you want to walk in and say, okay, God, I'm going to put you over here on the table for the rest of the week here until next Sunday, and then next Sunday I'll come back and and I'll pick up uh, your word again and bring it with me. I'm not scolding you folks. I'm trying to help everybody. We've all been guilty of these things a time or two. Amen? But isn't that what we do? Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. I'll tell you, the Scripture itself testifies itself. Jesus affirms when we get into the Scriptures and read it, we're talking about the inerrancy of Scripture, and you have all these bozos that want to say, well, you really believe in the sixth day of creation? Yes, I do. Because God's Word says so. And then and say, well, 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 wait a minute. Well, by the way, can I understand? May I, may I tell you that Jesus, uh, uh, and, and Jesus affirmed the Genesis account of creation? He affirmed that account? So how can we say we not believe it when Jesus confirmed it in the New Testament of what happened in the beginning God created? That's why the New Testament starts out in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus affirmed the creation, the, 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 the account of creation. Not only that, he confirmed, now hang on to your seats here, he confirmed the blueprint for marriage. We're going to turn to that one. Turn back to Matthew with me, if you would, please. Matthew chapter, uh, let's see here, we're looking at Matthew chapter 19. Everybody get back to Matthew chapter 19. All right, everybody, Matthew 19. Got my big family Bible here with me. Amen. Matthew 19, beginning verse number 4. And he answered and said unto them, this is Jesus, Have you not read, that's speaking of the Old Testament, that he which made them at the beginning, we're going back to Genesis, okay, Genesis chapter 3, I believe, on the sixth day of creation, on the sixth day God created man, he made him, he made male and female. He made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. He didn't make Eve and Sally. He made Adam and Eve from the beginning. And Jesus confirms the the, the blueprint for marriage right here, my friend. It's not man and man and woman and woman. It's a man and a woman. Have you not read that them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. Now, the only way a man can leave his father and mother, he had to have a father and a mother because it takes a father and a mother to produce a son. Hello, come on, talk to me, church. Amen. And the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they that are more than, uh, no more twain but one, wherefore, what God had joined together, let not man put asunder. From the very beginning, Jesus uh, confirmed creation. He confirmed the blueprint for marriage, that it is one man and one woman constitutes a marriage. And that one man and that one woman were given the biblical man to go and replenish the earth and multiply. So if you've only had one, you're not biblical. If you've only had two, you have, you're not biblical. If you only got one, you produced yourself. If you only got two, you duplicated yourself. Jesus said multiply. That's three or more. Hello. Ah, don't get mad at me. Amen. <laughs> we talk about the, uh, look, look, look at here, we're talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. Jesus used Jonah in the Old Testament in reference to his resurrection. I mean, you remember that. 
She, they were asking for a sign, remember? Because the Jews were always seeking a sign. They wanted a sign. And Jesus said, okay, here's the last sign you're going to get. As Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man, which was his title, spend three days in the, belly, in the heart of the earth. He used Jonah. You see, what do we do? The Scripture is without error. You believe that Jonah story? Absolutely, because God said it. And Jesus says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to confirm that story too, that it's God's word. As Jonah spent, I'm going to do it, the same thing in the resurrection. So he used the, the Old Testament of Jonah in reference to his resurrection. He used Noah in reference to his second coming. You can read in Matthew 24, 37, and 39. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. In the days of Noah, they were given in marriage and drinking and partying and having a good time, and they knew not when the flood came and washed them all away. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. Church, you'd better be ready because he could come today. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. And fifthly, we find the New Testament confirms the Scriptures. The New Testament concerns the Scriptures. While you're there, if you've turned there or you're still not there, go to 1 Timothy. We're going to look at a few of these up now and then, but not all of them. Look at 1 Timothy with me, if you would, please. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Everybody in 1 Timothy 5? All right, let's look at verse 18. The Scriptures confirm, or the New Testament confirms the Scriptures. Everybody in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 18. For the Scripture saith, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. When he says that, that's the Old Testament. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, of course, in the text, in the context here, he's talking about paying the pastor. That's what he's talking about. But he uses the reference here, confirms the Scripture. He's quoting, by the way, if you want to go look it up, he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4. That's what he's quoting. And then you have Luke 10, 7, 2 Peter 3, 16. So we see uh, this morning, uh, first of all, why we can trust the Bible, because the Bible is inspired, the Bible is unified, and the Bible is inerrant. It's without error. I don't care what the gurus say. That's their problem. The only person that's in error are them. God's Word is not in error. And they say, well, you believe all that? Yeah, I sure do. And when the rapture comes, I'm going to be gone and you're going to be standing here. Just like all those in the days of Noah, Jesus said, they wouldn't believe Noah. They could have got in the ark, which was a type of Christ. It was a salvation. Come into the ark. But they wouldn't come into the ark. And only eight were saved, Noah and his family. And the rest of the world perished in the flood. Now, the same thing is going to happen in the rapture of the church. Better make sure you're saved and you know it. Well, how can I know I'm saved? Because the Bible tells me so. How do I know how to get saved? The Bible will tell you so. You see, we go to the Word of God. That's why. You see, every Christian should know about the Bible. What do you need to know about the Bible? That you can trust it? Thank you, brother. Because why? It's number one, it's inspired. Come on, Becky, help me out. I see your mouth moving, but I don't hear anything. All right. Secondly, I can trust it because why? It's unified. Thirdly, I can trust it because it's what? It's inerrant. It's without correction. It's without error. I don't care what the world says, church. You have to make a choice in your own heart and mind today that you are going to believe that this is the inspired, inerrant, plenary, full word of God, or you don't. You can't straddle the fence. You've got to get on one side or the other. Simple as that. So we, we shared that to you. It, it, it's, it's inspired. It's unified. It's inerrant. Well, let's look at another one. Evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible. We asked you, can you trust the Bible? You've said yes. So let's look at the evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible. Is there evidence of it? Yes, there is. The external evidence outside of the Bible. We're going to help you with to learn how to, to, to study, to know it. All right, are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right, first of all, we're going to look at the outward evidences of the Scripture that it's trustworthy because of the dates of the New Testament books. Because of the dates of the New Testament books. 
Now, it's interesting, again, we have all these professors out here and gurus and, and, and spiritual, you know, whatever, I tell you that, oh, you see, the New Testament didn't come along until two, three hundred years uh, later. And, and they're, they're convinced of that. And then, then that's why, then at that point, if that was the case, if that was true, then there's a good possibility that there could be errors, there could be problems, because after 300 years, something has happened, and all the stories get out, no telling what's going to come out. Okay? Right? But it wasn't. Ladies and gentlemen, the New Testament was written between 40 and 65 A.D., now, Jesus died in 33 A.D., so just somewhere between 7 and 10 years later, we have the first book of the New Testament recorded by the half-brother of our Lord, the book of James. No two, three hundred years. So all this is very fresh in their mind. And by the way, God said, Jesus told them, by the way, when I go and leave, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to bring to your remembrance the things that I have told you. Why? Because these authors were moved by the Holy Ghost. Most of the New Testament was written within 40 to 65 years after the resurrection of Christ. Only a few lingered on. And that would be, of course, the book of Revelation. That was completed in 95, 96 A.D. Last book of the, Old, of the New Testament was written. Went to Jerusalem, went to the church fathers, the early fathers. They accepted it. The Church of Jerusalem Council accepted it. And, and it became canonized. And that was the completion of the New Testament by 95, 96 A.D. When John the Revelator came back off the Isle of Patmos. No two, three hundred years. At the most, 50 years, 60 years. At the most. You see. And by the way, this happened right after the resurrection of Christ, not hundreds and hundreds of years, because of the dates of the New Testament. Then we have the early acceptance of the message. The early acceptance of the message. Now, this is going to really surprise you a little bit. You know who the early acceptance of the message was? What group of people? It was the Jews. It wasn't the Gentiles. It was the Jews. See, there were more Jews saved than you think and thought there were. There were multitudes of Jews that turned from Judaism to Christianity, to their newfound faith in Christ. And you see, because that, the acceptance of that message, and the reason why we know that, because the fact that so many changes were made, especially by the Jews. One of the big ones is over, and we find, and the believers, the Christians, met on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, no longer on Saturday, the Sabbath, because the Jewish believers changed that change, and that was a major change. They also did away with a lot of their dietary rules and their laws. They did away with the rituals and the ceremonial rites and the rituals and all of that. There was a multitude of changes made because of the message that they had accepted and received of Christ. This is how your Bible came into being. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's fantastic. Thirdly, there, see, because of the fulfilled prophecies. What are we asking? What about the evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible? Well, because of the dates, the acceptance of the message. Thirdly, the fulfilled prophecies. How many of you know about the prophecies in the Bible? Just to give you an example, in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, 700 years before Christ. Are you with me? Isaiah prophesied that Israel would go into captivity by Babylon. That happened. Then Isaiah prophesied in the book of Isaiah that Babylon would then be overthrown by the Persian, the Greed Omitian Persian Empire. That happened. Then he also prophesied that under King uh, uh, Persia, King Darius under Persia would release the Jews and they would go back to their homeland uh, in Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. That happened. This was all prophesied 700 years before Christ was ever born in the Old Testament. That's just some of the prophecies. Okay, are you with me? I hope you are. You can read that in Isaiah chapter 39, verses 5 through 6, Isaiah 21, 39. The king of Persia, he lets the Jews go back. All this took place in 586. Captivity, 339, they were released. Uh, 539, they went home. And by the way, 
61 prophecies were prophesied in the Old Testament of the first coming of Christ. 61 prophecies prophesied of the coming of Christ. Are, are you with me on this? Amen. Amen. All of them were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In His coming. All 61 prophecies that was prophesied 700 years before Christ was born. Are you with me? There's a great mathematician, forget his name, he, he was Mr. Mathematics himself in the world, known scholarly mathematician. He said, I'm going to figure out what would be the possibilities of that happening. How many prophecies could be fulfilled by one man, one man, 61 of them be fulfilled by one man. So he took eight of the major prophecies just eight could one man possibly fulfill even eight of those prophecies in order for that to happen the number would have been 10 to the 17th power that's a one with 17 zeros behind it for just eight prophecies being fulfilled yet alone 61 one had put it this way take a silver dollar put an X on it Cover the state of Texas in two feet of silver dollars. Blindfold that person and tell them to walk across the state and find the X silver dollar. And yet, all 61 prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus Christ because if he could only have filled eight of them, it would have been one with 17 zeros behind it, but he fulfilled all 61. You see, that's why I can trust the worthiness of the Bible because of its dates of the writing of the New Testament, because of the acceptance of the message of the early church fathers and especially the Jews and the fulfilled prophecies that took place. And thirdly, this one will blow, fourthly, this will blow your mind. Because of the archaeology discoveries. We're talking about the external trustworthiness of the Bible. Can we trust this book? What every Christian should know about his Bible. Up until just 150 years ago, they didn't want to trust this book. Because there was no real external evidences. But in the last 150 years, archaeologists have discovered an awful lot. Cities. Roman pier columns. Dates on plaques and pottery and metal of everything. Dating everything exactly the time period of the Bible. And even the archaeologists that aren't even saved, some of them, have testified that the Bible is correct. That there are, there are externals, enough external proofs to prove it. And the greatest one, oh, the greatest one, was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. Amen. Many of you, some of you were born there way before then. In Mickey's lifetime. They discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. So, wow, I mean, my goodness, praise the Lord. All right. So, in the last 150 years, has proven the Bible to be true. That's why the trustworthiness of this book. So, why can I trust it? Because it's number one, it's inspired. Number two, it's unified. Number three, it's inerrant. How about the evidence of the trustworthiness of the Bible? Number one, the dates of the New Testament. Number two, the early acceptance of the message of the fathers. Number three, the fulfilled prophecies of the Bible. Now, I just gave you a small example of the prophecies that have been fulfilled. Okay? All right, thirdly this morning then, why can we trust the Bible today? Why can we trust the Bible today? Three ways I want to give you. Three ways. Number one, the accuracy. The accuracy of the copies. How many times have we heard people say, well, we don't have the originals? Well, we don't have all the originals. That portion is true. 
but the accuracy of the copies. Let me just give you an example of that. Why can I trust this book? How do we know this is the Word of God? How do we know that the, what's written in here is the Word? And because after all, we don't have the originals. Well, I have some good news for you. We have 10,000 copies of the Old Testament Scripture. The most popular is what I just shared with you, the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947, which contains it, almost the whole book of Isaiah. Okay? We have nearly 25,000 manuscripts of the New Testament. 25,000 manuscripts. Okay? That's equivalent to 200. And, and then we have 20,000 lines of text in the Greek New Testament. That's 250 pages. The words that are in question are only 40 out of the 20,000, which is equivalent to one page of the 250. And those words that are questions are like, was it a, it was the green tree or it was a, a green tree? That's the words that are questioned. Wow. That's the accuracy. So how do we know we have the high standard of inclusion? Because we have all 39 Old Testament and 27 New Testament books of the Bible. Well, what about the answers to the contradictions in the Bible? How many of you have heard that one? You see a hand in here this morning. How many of you have heard people say, well, there's a whole lot of contradictions in the Bible? That's why I always like to ask them, we'll take the Bible, hand it to them, and say, show me one. Just one. Can you just give me one little one since there are so many Surely you would know one, and they can't do it. They can't. Or here's what they'll do. Here's one they'll pull on you. They'll pull this one. Well, in the New Testament, Paul describes the plague in the Old Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, that killed 24,000 people, or 23,000. But in Moses' writing, Moses wrote that there were 23,000 killed in one day. Contradiction? Not at all. Moses just said 23,000 died in one day. Paul said there was a total of 24. So that means another 1,000 died two or three days later because of the plagues. See, not everybody dies the same day. No contradiction. That's not hard. That's not contradicted, and it can't be contradiction because all Scripture is inspired and given by God. So if God told Moses to write 23,000 died in one day, and then he told Paul to write 24,000 died total. Amen? Prime example. Bless those poor people down south. First reports, we had over 100. Well, then it came out, and there was only six. And then it was this number. Then it was that number. You see, was there a contradiction? No. Not all the tallies come in yet. It's already been three, four days now. You see, we won't know until it's all said and done. Now, even if they could have tallied it all just, or tallied what they could in that one day, that first day, they came up with, say, 20. That's all they could find or see. But now they're finding out three or four days later, here's another 10 here, here's another 15 over here. You see, so, you see, there's no contradiction. There was no contradiction. Moses was around when he wrote it, and that's how many died in one day. But remember, it was a plague. Not everybody dies in one day in a plague. The blue, blue bonnet plague. Not everybody died in one day in the blue bonnet plague. Not everybody died in one day in the yellow fever. Not everybody died one day in the smallpox. So see, no contradiction. But some will pull that stunt. You can read it. I, in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 8, uh, Paul says that there were 23,000. Moses, writing in the book of Numbers 25, 9, says there was 25 that died. But Paul, when Paul, I got it reversed. Paul said in one day. Moses never said one day. He just said 23. Okay? So Moses, so, so we find that. 
Moses said there, Moses gave the total. Now, here's another one. And you and I can experience this. I mean, you remember the, 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 the resurrection of Christ. All right? We have different accounts of it, don't we? We have Matthew writes about it, I believe. Yes, Matthew writes about it. Uh, let's see, who else here? Luke writes about it. And they're both writing about it. Matthew tells us, and he's writing here, that uh, in that day, Matthew says, Matthew says, he saw one angel. Luke says he saw two angels. Was there a contradiction? No. There were two. I'll give you an example. Ted and I were out here one day, a few years back, and we were over here. Most of the day's work was done. It was one of the late summer days, and, and the evening was setting in. One of those times we were out here late trying to get it done, and, and I looked up, and out here in this part of the ball field, right straight out here in the ball field, I said, hey, Ted, man, look at that. Look at that deer out there. That's got to be an eight-pointer. You know, we had a good-sized rack on each side. From my eyesight to there, I could see a little better. Uh, it looked like eight points. Now, Ted says, yeah, but do you see the other three standing over here? Two men saw the same thing at the same time. But I was focused on the one with the eight-point buck. Ted had seen the other three over here. Contradiction? Not at all. If you popped in, rode up to the, to the stone, and you saw one inside and one sitting on top, and you ran inside first, and that one spoke to you, and the other one didn't, who would you pay more attention to? You'd take, pay, pay more attention to the one that spoke to you, since the other one was silent. That's the story you have in the Scripture. No contradiction. Not at all. You can go to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. You can read that Sermon on the Mount. We went through it here a couple of times. Seven, uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He recorded it. But you go over into Luke's chapter 6, and Luke records it. What do we have? For one, we have two different locations. For another, we have probably Jesus either preached the same message or something like it. But no contradiction. No contradiction in the Word of God, church. It's not. Luke heard him preach on a, in another location. And, you know, I've preached uh, not too often here, but occasionally the same message. And it's been a little different. And, and you've heard a little different, a little different outline. Is there contradiction? Not at all. Matter of fact, you can preach 100 messages out of one verse. This Bible isn't exhaustive. You can't exhaust it. Well, is it contradiction because I give you a whole new outline and a whole different look? Not, not at all. So there are no contradictions in the Bible. The problem is, is with the people. And then ask them to prove it and show it to you, and they can't come up with it. They just can't do it. And man, there'll be people who just simply refuse to believe this book, to accept this book, because, oh, it's just so full of errors and mistakes and contradictions. Friend, there is not, because to say that is to call God a liar. Because my Bible tells me that all Scripture is given by inspiration, and it is by God, you see, who gave it. So I can trust the Bible today because of the accuracy of it. I can trust it because of the high standard of it. And I can trust it because there are no contradictions in the Bible. So then what does the Bible mean for us today? What does it mean for us today? It is God's message to us. Let me give you three wonderful thoughts that the Bible does for us today, the message. The Bible frees us. The Bible frees us. Thank you, brother. How many of you are free today? That's what the Bible did for you. The Bible freed you. 
Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, uh, uh, and is discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, the Bible frees you and I, first of all, to know the truth. Are you with me, church? To know the truth. Jesus told Thomas, I am the truth. Thomas said, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know how to get there. In John 14, right? Jesus gave five, four verses there and told him where we're going and how he's going to get there. But then Thomas says in verse 5, well, we don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. So Jesus in verse 6 tells Thomas, John 14, 6, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto my Father except by me. Okay? You, you, we all got that, right? That's John 14, 6. When you come over to John 8, 8, 32, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And he comes down in verse 36, and he says, If you have the Son, which is the truth, you shall be free indeed. So you see, oh, what does the Bible mean to me and you today and to the world today? The Bible will free you. It will free you from the penalty of sin. It will free you from the power of sin. It will free you from the domain of sin. And bless God, one day it will free you from the very presence of sin. That's what this book will do for you. That's why we can trust it. With our life, our family, our home, our church, everything. The Bible frees us from sin uh, to live a, li a, live a, live a God-honoring life. You can't live the, the separated life apart from Christ. You can't live an honoring life to God apart from Jesus. You see, you just can't. Well, not only does the Bible free us, but the Bible guides us. The Bible guides us. In Psalm 32, 8, we'll use a couple of Old Testament first of all. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. Everybody get that verse? Your Bible that you have in your lap there just told you, God's breathed word just told you that he will instruct you and he will teach you in the way that you should go. And he says, and I will guide you with my eyes. Isn't that great? In Psalms 119, 105, the Bible says that the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And by the way, folks, that's daily. Six days from now, a flashlight and a lamp's not going to do you any good until you get there. But what you need today is you need a lamp for your feet and you need a little flashlight to guide each step you're going to take to get to where you're going tomorrow. In John 16, 13, Jesus said this, How be it, when he, speaking of the Holy Spirit, and somebody says, well, who's the he there? Look at the next phrase. This is what I said, let the Bible interpret the Bible, amen? Can't go wrong. How be it, when he, well, who's the he? The Spirit of truth is come. He, the Spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And, and, and he will show you things to come. What's the Holy Spirit going to speak? The Holy Spirit's going to speak the truth to you because he hears the truth from the one who is the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible frees you and I to know and to do God's will. Now lastly, the Bible inspires us. It inspires us. While you have your Bible there, look at First Tim, uh, Philippians, just back a few pages, and you'll have Philippians, and then we are going to go to Jeremiah. Philippians chapter uh, 1 and verse 6. Everybody in Philippians 1, 6? Everybody in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, okay? Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That ought to inspire you. That's what inspires this preacher. What does? To know that the work that God has started in me, Miss Cindy, he's going to perform it until he comes in the clouds of glory. That inspires me, John. CJ. Now turn over to Jeremiah with me. See if you all can find Jeremiah. Whoever finds it first, shout out the page number. 
Well, because it'll all be about the same place. All right. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. We'll start at the very beginning. All right, Jeremiah chapter 1. Everybody in Jeremiah chapter 1, if you don't know, go to the index in the Bible, and it'll tell you what page it's on. All right, she says 846 in her Bible. All right, so get somewhere in the 800s, you'll find it. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 1, everybody in chapter 1, here we go. My Bible is, uh, what page is it on? Oh, mine's on 921. All right, so somewhere in the 800s, you're going to find Jeremiah. All right, everybody got the book of Jeremiah? Let's see if the Old Testament of Jeremiah can inspire us a little bit today. All right, since we've been studying this book for about 45 minutes here, and we're just, we're just about done. All right, Jeremiah chapter 1, and everybody chapter 1, verse number 12. Verse number 12. Then saith the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. You see, whatever God's word says, he's going to perform it. That ought to inspire you. Okay, and we know what God's word says. Go to chapter 29, if you would. Jeremiah chapter 29. Look at another wonderful verse here in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. This one really, I like this one. Now, folks, if you're down today and you're discouraged today, you ought to jump out of your pew and shout hallelujah. Now, I'm just saying that. Verse 11, God's writing to Jeremiah. God says, for I know the thoughts, that means plans, that I think toward you. Aren't you glad God thinks toward you? Aren't you glad God's got a plan for you? Saith the Lord, thoughts or plans of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. We're all coming to an end one day. But God has a thoughts towards me. Plans towards me. That he's going to give me an expected end. One day. That inspires me. Oh that inspires me. So this morning. Why can I trust the Bible? Miss Becky, tell us why. It's an errand. All right. Evidence for the trustworthiness of the Bible. Because of what? Tell me. Because of the dates, the acceptance, the fulfillment, fulfilled prophecies, and the archaeology discoveries. Why can I trust it today? Because of the accuracy of the copies, the high standard for inclusion. Okay? And, and the answer to contradictions. So what does the Bible mean for us today? It frees us. It guides us. It inspires us. So those of you that are watching and listening right now, I'll go back to the first one of that. What does the Bible will do for you today? It will free you. It'll free you from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, the domain of sin, the ruin of sin. And one day, bless God, it'll free you from the very presence of sin. But that's only to those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Only to those who have been saved and born again. That's what the Bible will do for you. Put all this other stuff aside that you've listened to and heard from everybody else. Listen to this message this morning. Listen to this pastor who loves you and cares about your soul more than anybody else does, especially more than the devil does, because the devil doesn't care about your soul at all. The devil wants to take you to hell. I want to take you to heaven. Hallelujah. And you can by knowing what the Bible will do for you. It'll free you. You're here today and you've never been saved. And here in the auditorium, you're watching on Rumble and Facebook and everywhere else, YouTube and the television and radio, my friend. If you've never been saved and born again, the Bible will free you. The Bible will set you free. Jesus said that. He said, man, he said, the Bible will set you free. And you shall be free indeed. Why? Because he is the way and the truth and the life. So my friend, if you've never been saved or born again, here's your chance to be free today. Just think of that. You can be free. You can go out of here shout, thank God I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Hey, even if you're in prison, because that's what we're going to talk about tonight, you can still be free. You can still be free. You can be free in the prison from the prison of your mind, 
You can be free from incarceration if you're in prison behind bars. You can be made and set free by the power of the gospel of this Bible. If you're just willing to believe it. By faith. I can't do it for you. But we want to help you get free today. I want you to pray with us. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And His finished work on the cross of Calvary. What He did. And Jesus said if you'll receive that and embrace that and believe that, you will be made free. Free indeed. Free at last. So we're going to ask you to come to Christ today and be free. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to confess with our mouth. He's the Lord from heaven. We're going to confess with our mouth that we're a sinner. We've sinned against God. We're going to confess with our mouth that we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we're going to confess that he rose again on the third day. And then you know what we're going to do? We're going to call on him and we're going to receive him. Not hard, not difficult. You want to be set free today? Here it is. Here's the remedy for you. Right here. Simply pray with me. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. Go ahead. God bless you. I confess, God, yes, I'm a sinner. No doubt about it. And I've sinned against you in heaven. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will, based on the authority and the promise of God's word. I do now believe, there's faith, trust, in my heart, that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He paid my sin debt. He took my place on Calvary that day. I, 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 and I believe he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, the Bible, the word of God. And so right now, right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you and invite you to come into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior to take me to heaven someday when I die or at the rapture, whichever comes first. And I pray this simple little prayer of faith in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening and watching and tuning in with us. We'll trust many of you today prayed with us to receive Christ so you could be set free.